<laughs> OK, so um, this is a list of the Earth materials lectures and tutorial. Today, I will be giving the lecture on the mantle. And then in the afternoon, we'll do a tutorial on the equations of state. So the mantle is a very large reservoir for the Earth. Usually, we talk about it including the crust. In terms of thickness, it's not the thickest uh, layer because the core uh, is thicker from 29.2. So the mantle almost comes from the top to 2,900 kilometers. That's, uh, everybody knows that. Sometimes people don't really pay attention to the volume fraction and the mass fraction of the different layers of the mantle. So if you th think about the total mass is more than 70%. And the lower mantle, the mass is more than 40%. Transition zone and the upper mantle is about a quarter of the Earth's mass. And in terms of volume, the lower mantle is really the most massive uh, reservoir in the Earth. And the transition zone accounts for about 10%, the upper mantle about 20%. So that's the region we are looking at. And what we are interested in as material scientists studying Earth is how are Earth's processes controlled by material properties. And when we think about this, we have to look at the uh, pressure temperature composition space. And when we think about the deep time, we also want to see how these uh, properties will change as a function of time as the pressure, temperature, and the composition change with time. And when we talk about the material properties, that will include a whole range of properties, including density, elasticity, sound velocities, viscosities, and also the geochemical properties like phase equilibrium and element partitioning. So that's the overall theme of what we study. And we always go back to the seismic observation of the Earth. And our goal is to interpret 1D. One of the goals is to interpret 1D seismic profiles and the rock records in terms of composition, uh, chemical, thermal, and then as a function of time. And this is the PREM model in the mantle. What we see is we have the density, shear velocity and the compressional sound velocity plotted as a function of pressure or increasing depth. And we see a lot of wiggles over here. We have multiple jumps in pressure and Vs and Vp. And we want to understand what causes these jumps. So the seismic data alone won't be able to tell us the composition and the temperature regime. So we look at samples, rock records from the mantle. This is a picture of the mantle xenolith, which I like very much because it looks really artistic. You see the facade and the olivine, the color and the uh, configuration look really beautiful. So from this type of rocks and the crustal rocks, we can figure out uh, different models of chemical composition for the Earth. And these things, we can combine them together. So we squeeze, we get a compositional model, and we will work in the lab trying to figure out what kind of mineralogy you will end up with. This is a plot of a mineralogical composition as a function of depth in the, in the mantle. And we see that in the upper mantle, we have mostly olivine. We also have garnet, clinoperoxene, orthoperoxene. And in the transition zone, the olivine will turn into wasleyite, also known by some people as the beta olivine, right? We call the beta phase wasleyite. And then uh, at the bottom of the, uh, and then there's a, in the middle of the transition zone, it makes another phase transition into ringwoodite. And then once it goes through the bottom of the transition zone, it will break down into two phases, the olivine phase and the other phases as well. They will convert into mainly two phases, ferropericlase and the magnesium silicate perovskite. There's also a fraction of calcium uh, silicate perovskite. So that's the picture when we combine the rock records and the seismic determination of pressure inside of the Earth and try to figure out what kind of a mineralogical components are present there. Exactly. Yes? That's very true because uh, that's right. So I will, oh, I, <clears throat> I forgot to mention in the first slide I have on the X there's a question mark. We really have a lot of uncertainty about what the Earth's composition is. So the proportions of the, the mineral, different components will vary. And I will talk about that later on. So if we combine these things together, 
one goal to interpret 1D seismic profile in terms of composition, temperature, and then as a function of time. We have some significant issues. For instance, the lithosphere, athenosphere boundary, what causes that? Is there a melt there? Uh, is water causing uh, the anomalies in the seismic velocities? And the transition zone discontinuity, of course, this has been a classical problem for a long time. We want to understand the depth of the discontinuity, what phase relation, uh, phase transitions they correspond to, the width of the discontinuity, which would be related to uh, the presence of iron, how iron partition between different phases. Because if you have a single ma magnesium end member, you would expect a pure, uh, ba a very sharp boundary, but the boundary has certain uh, finite width. And also there are multiple phases uh, present, which also contribute to the width of the boundary. Then you also look at the boundary, the jump. What's the magnitude of the jumps? How that corresponds to density and the velocity changes across those phase transitions and the presence of iron and other elements. And then you have topography. This is uh, created dynamically. When you have plate tectonics, when the slabs subduct down and plumes rising up, because of the clapeyron slope of the transitions and the kinetics of the uh, movements, you would generate topography that makes a boundary instead of a smooth, like one depth boundary it has uh, different depths at a different region. So I will talk about these different uh, properties in, the, in this lecture. And then we also have, the, in this region, more recently we have discovered, a lot of uh, seismologists have discovered a lot of uh, features in the DW prime zone. And that has been attributed to phase transitions in the perovskite, post perovskite phase transitions. And we also want to know if there's any uh, interaction at the core mantle boundary, any kind of uh, chemical reactions going on at this uh, lowermost mantle region. And then in terms of deep time, uh, we would have to think about a very different pressure temperature scheme, maybe much higher temperature and a different material interaction. For instance, magma ocean overturn, the density would play a very important role. And we need to understand how the uh, density will change when you shift to a different parameter space in terms of pressure and temperature. So this is one goal, looking at the 1D seismic profile. And then, of course, the next one would be trying to explain the seismic topo uh, tomography together with different geochemical domains. So now we're thinking about heterogeneity, lateral heterogeneity in the mantle. And this is uh, one of the uh, review paper by uh, Garnero, oh, actually not a review paper, I was trying to debate which tomography paper to include, but this one is very artistic, so it's nice. And Adam showed, Adam showed a lot of uh, uh, five different groups have those models. You have seen those domains, uh, two degree features in the mantle. And this one shows laterally you have a hot region and cold region, maybe subduction and plume rising and different lenses over here, which I will explain uh, later. So you have all these kind of features in the mantle according to the seismic tomography study. And we want to explain in terms of compositional uh, heterogeneity or thermal heterogeneity, and how does this change as a function of time? So, and while seismologists were studying those uh, red and the blue blobs in the mantle, the geochemists, they come up with all kinds of uh, geochemical domains. Uh, Al Hoffman used to call these the uh, mantle zoo. So you have like Bozo, High Mu, and different domains. They have different elementary uh, chemi chemical and isotopic signatures. And these domains, supposedly, they are isolated from each other in the mantle. And we would like to know what what are the history of the domains, what are the origin, how they are going to mix or unmix over time. And to study those things, we need to uh, combine material properties with geodynamic models. This is a, a pretty well-known and relatively old now, the model. But it shows the concept how you would uh, combine geodynamic modeling with mineral physics uh, parameters and trying to explain the tomography and the geochemical observations. So if we look at these kind of, uh, what kind of properties we would be interested in, if we think about the plate tectonics, uh, yesterday Bruce Buffett introduced these modeling where you need to know density, viscosity, conductivity, 
and for mantle convection, which, by the way, is separate from plate tectonics because they don't have to go together, right? Some planet, planets have convection without plate tectonics. And you want to know Rayleigh number. For that, you need to know the density, viscosity, conductivity, heat capacity of all the materials that are involved in the convection. And then we also want to know the core mantle interaction because that interaction might uh, be creating those features at the double prime zone and maybe it's uh, even more responsible for some of the surface uh, observations like a play, uh, PGEs on the surface. And you would like to know the partitioning of different elements between the core and the mantle as a function of time, you know, at different conditions and different time, and how materials would be transported either as a uh, independent component or as elements that partition into different phases. So that's the overall kind of goal of mineral physics or earth materials, trying to understand the 1D profile and the 3D tomography and then all the geochemical observations in the rec uh, rock records. So this is a very, very broad kind of uh, topic. And I want to focus on one thing today. That is the role of iron in mantle evolution. Because iron is the key component in the core, but it plays a critical role in determining the property and the dynamics of the mantle. If you look at this mineralogical kind of plot again, you see different colors for those minerals, different minerals. The olivine is familiar garnet these pe uh, people have seen, but some people may have never seen a picture of wasleyite or ringwoodite, you know, have this very nice blue color, green color over here, different green from olivine. And the ferroparaclase, relatively dark, opaque. The silicate uh, provskite has very light, a uh, pistachio type of green. Yes, these phases are quenchable. That's uh, quenched, recovered, actually. I think uh, Dave knows very well about the studies from. Oh, yes, it's quenchable. It easily metamorphizes, but it is quenchable. Yes, all those phases can be recovered. And these colors, they tell us that they are not pure magnesium end member. The the, uh, the color is mainly due to the presence of iron. When you have a lot of iron, for instance, in ferropericlase, it becomes very dark because iron is a transition metal. It absorbs light uh, in different way from the magnesium. If you have a pure magnesium member, it would be transparent. So iron are present in all these minerals. And then the, their, the presence of iron would affect the transition depths and partitioning of iron would create a different density contrast and it will affect the viscosity and the shear velocity significantly. It also, of course, iron as a transition metal, it has different oxidation state. And the oxygen viscosity and the oxidation state plays a really important role in the chemistry of the mantle. And then because it's a transition metal, it also has a spin state. And the spin crossover is a relatively new topic that I'm going to spend some time on to introduce to uh, people. And then we have uh, iron. When you add iron to a phase, it's going to increase its density. Usually, it decreases velocity. And it's going to affect its elastic behavior. It also has important implications for the transport pro uh, properties. So we really want to focus on understanding how iron affects uh, material properties and how it would lead to different consequences in mental dynamics and evolution. So going back to very uh, basics, I want to talk about the phase transition starting from coordination number. So if you have taken mineralogy, you know about the Pauline's rules. This uh, Linus Pauling, very smart, the only two people in the world who have won a Nobel Prize twice. And he come up with this uh, five rules. And here we'll talk about the two of the uh, basic rules. Rule number one is when you have cation and anion, the cation will be surrounding, or the other way around, the anion will surround cation. And the number of anion to cation would be de determined by the radius ratio, how big these ions are. And we know, if you look at the, uh, the mantle, from mineral physics point of view, the mantle basically is a closed packed oxygen with uh, cations kind of uh, stuck into the uh, interstices. Because oxygen is really large. At the ambient condition, it's 1.4 angstrom in the radius. 
And then all the other cations, like magnesium, iron, they're much smaller. They are on the order of 0.8, and aluminum is only 0.6. So you can think of the mantle as a huge, close-packed oxygen balls with cations stuck in. And then depending on the ratio between the cation and the anion, you, you will know how many oxygen will be surrounding any particular cation. For instance, for silicon oxygen, usually we have the uh, tetrahedral configuration. You would have four oxygen surrounding each silicon. In the upper mantle condition, this is the case. But once you increase pressure, because oxygen compresses much faster than the uh, cations, cations are smaller, they're less compressible. The oxygen are larger, they're more compressible. So the ratio will go up. And as a result, you would have a higher ratio over here. And then you end up with the octahedral configuration. So that happens when you go through the transition zone. You have a coordination number change. This kind of coordination number change leads to the phase transition. And that phase transition leads to a lot of influence, a lot of consequences in the properties. So if you think about this phase diagram, here's olivine. This is a polyhedral representation of olivine. What you see these uh, blue tetrahedra here, these are the silicon oxygen tetrahedra. In the, at the low pressure, you have olivine, you have these kind of configuration. The tetrahedra, they're isolated from each other. They connect through the cations, magnesium and iron. This uh, yellow one represents magnesium, and then the, the orange-brown one represents iron. Uh, magnesium and iron, they are much larger than silicon. Silicon is only about 0.4. Therefore, they form octahedra already at low pressure. So you have these kind of uh, crystal structure. When you compress uh, within the Wasleyite, the Spinel kind of regime, you still have the mostly four coordination, but they have different uh, octa the connection of the tetrapolyhedron. So that's the third rule of um, the Pauline's rule about how the octahedra would connect to each other. Usually they avoid being close to each other. They would have corner uh, to corner connection so that the cations will be away from each other as, as far from each other as possible to avoid the kind of, uh, uh, they have the repulsive forces among each other. But when you compress this material, it actually forms a disilicate. That means the two tetrahedra of silicon would connect to each other. And you go to higher pressure, it turns into this spinel structure, which is a uh, oxide structure that's more compact, so the density would be higher. But then when you go through this uh, 660 base boundary, about 25 GPA, we have a fundamental change in the coordination number. So here, what we see, these um, octahedra here, these are silicon oxygen octahedron they would already convert into different coordination number and create a much denser structure. And in the middle, we have the uh, Mg cations over here. And as a result of this coordination change, we actually have a breakdown. So the magnesium is no longer compatible in the perovskite structure. You form two separate phases. One is oxide, one is silicate with six coordination. And this kind of phase transition is well known. And the effect of this phase transition, if you look at this table, this is alpha uh, olivine, beta phase wasleyite, gamma phase ringwoodite, a perovskite, and a peri uh, this is periclase. This is a pure end member. I mentioned that we have iron, but you know, the first thing to look at is to ignore the effect of iron. Just look at the end member. And you can see the density increase from 3.2 to 3.5. And this one is a relatively small increase over here. That's why this transition, some people consider 520 tra uh, transition, but it's not really a, um, a major boundary. And probably it gets uh, uh, diffused because of the presence of other phases. But when you go through this uh, ringwoodite to perovskite transition, then you have a significant change in the, uh, in the density. And if you look at the bulk modulus, there's also an outstanding feature that the perovskite is a lot more incompressible. The bulk modulus is much larger. That has consequences because when you have such a large bulk modulus, the sound velocity would be much higher. And you have rigidity, this is a shear modulus, and then uh, sound velocities, VP, VS, they all have uh, corresponding uh, changes. So when you have an increase in, uh, in density 
here the bulk modulus increase more than the density increase, therefore your VP actually goes up. And so it's over here. So you have the phase transition and it directly affect the sound, uh, the seismic properties and the uh, elasticity. Yes. These are ambient, uh, that's right. Once you have a high temperature, uh, the, the properties will change. That's a good point to clarify. So if you look at the boundary, the changes, the delta P, this is changed just as a function of pressure from 0 to 14 GPA. This is compression alone within the same phase. And then this is the thermal effect. If you just increase temperature, how much change it will uh, produce. And this is the result of phase transition from alpha to beta. And here we compare with the seismic uh, observation. This one is actually from AK135. So alpha to beta transition, beta to gamma transition, and here is the breakdown. And you can see that these are the uh, observed the trans um, properties according to mineral physics. These, these are all observed uh, properties according to mineral physics, and the red ones are the seismic observations. So they are not exactly matching to each other. And that kind of information can tell us how much oliving would be there. Apparently, it cannot be all oliving because they don't match the jumps, right? And you have to consider these measurements are probably for the pure magnesium end member. You have to add iron into it and see how much that's going to affect the density velocity jumps. And then you have other phases present and you have to consider those. So those kind of data will help us establish, you know, test the different compositional models and establish what really are the causes for those observed seismic kind of discontinuities. So now I want to uh, explain a little bit about the Clapeyron slope, which comes up very often. Yes, Patrick. Uh, with the different compositional models, yes. to what extent you can get a unique solution? Uh, I think the answer is uh, you cannot get a unique solution just based on mineralogical and uh, seismic data, because you have enough trade-offs between different phases. You, you can, uh, the best way is to come up, start from maybe geochemical models and then combine with mineral physics data to test the different models, whether they match the seismic thing, uh, observations. It's not a unique, if it, it were, although, um, you know, re later on I will show, sometimes you can get a pretty strong constraint. If your data are reliable, the constraint can be very strong. For the lower mantle, there's a recent study showing that the, the lower mantle might be very uh, rich in perovskite, and that's purely based on mineral physics and the seismology without considering any geochemical constraint. Uh, <coughs> there is a uh, Adam, I will come get uh, additional Data which is difficult to obtain but would be very interesting is the reflection coefficient and conversion coefficient that is going through these boundaries. Uh, waves are reflected, they are refracted, and uh, then the additional constraints on density. So, uh, Why do we need to? Mm. because it could change from place to place. It would be another way of following the uh, lateral happening. Okay, so that's really going uh, one step further. At this point, we're kind of still considering a 1D model. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's right, that's right, yes. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I will get back to you. Yeah. How large a depth range is that discontinuity measure? Which? The velocity discontinuity for that. Yeah, or that number, that high pressure range. Yeah, 20 kilometers. Plus minus 20 kilometers. The determination of that is a little bit challenged by knowing the
Yeah, I think if you uh, secretly pull all the tight mullets in the room, you go from saying, So is it in a to do list in my opinion of our community? Could I just ask a follow up question? Would the cat your estimates as a deep loss be challenged for the size molecule? Uh, a similar question would be what would be the variations of the cat for the challenge for the size of the population? Do we see places where velocity jump is bigger? Or in other places where velocity is constantly smaller? This is still a question for seismologists. <laughs> But that's also a pure end member, one single phase, right? That's an ideal case. So that's just to show that you can use this to uh, place constraints. I think from what I heard, the most uh, uh, robust constraint would be the jump, like the location of the jump, and also the gradients, right, in the, uh, the change in density and velocities. Those are more, more um, ro reliable seismic observations. And the other magnitude, width, and all the other things are less certain. Maybe a bill, bill has been really uh, waiting to. Uh, my comment, to the, which I didn't mean to interrupt Adam, but, this, but my comment was also when considering whether or not a mineral physics experiment has uh, constraints, it's also how well it mimics the composition of the system that's being studied. Yeah, eventually we cannot provide independent um, but I constraint. Think that's an important variable as you said, the recent paper by Murakami reaches some bold conclusions on a hopelessly inadequate. <laughs> That's uh, yes. I think I think people might have a different opinion about that. It's not that I believe in that result, <laughs> but I think you know it's it's interesting. It's definitely a provocative uh, conclusion and has a lot of implications. I know geochemists in this room probably many of them are not happy with that result. It's not my work. And I know that work has weakness, so we can discuss that. Yeah, that's uh, maybe. Should I jump ahead to show that, or okay? So one pin had okay. One more question. Yeah. Uh, you mean the pressure effect and the, right. oh. So the, 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 it looks, I mean, you're getting 10% uh, uh. by pressurizing and losing 10% by, by Yeah, I guess if you look at the olivine, uh, pure olivine alone, maybe that is the case. And if you go back to the uh, 1D profile, let's see, in the upper mantle VP over here, it's a kind of a more or less vertical. It's not changing that much, so but maybe that makes sense. So the thermal effect and pressure effect, somehow they are against each other, yeah. One Pings, do you still have a question? Uh, this one is really uh, not a very high resolution, right? This is 20 GPA over here, so we're talking about things. The, qu the question is about uh, the, uh, the countering effect of the pressure and temperature, whether it's consistent with the PREM model. So because the, this uh, thermal and the pressure effect would predict that you don't have, uh, oops, the wrong way. Well, the anisotropic. Mm -hmm. That's right, yes, for different uh, directions. And olivine is also anisotropic, so that involves dynamic uh, alignment and the texture and so on. Mark? Just to clarify, that change from 0 to 14 GPA of 1700 yeah. Kelvin, yeah. it's not as if those very linearly with one another in the mantle. First, That's right. That's a good point, right? And also depends on at what pressure you are changing the temperature, so there are all these involved. Uh, variations, but on on the first order, it's true they are opposite in, uh, from each other. Yes. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, the time scale of the transition, yeah, the kinetics of the transition, people have been studying that. And that's not, uh, from olivine to uh, the alpha to beta transition, I think there are some results. At this point, um, we, I think we are not quite at the stage of resolving the, the kinetics of the transition and trying to correlate with seismic observations. There are some impedance kind of measurements, and people talk about how this transition uh, would show up when you uh, probe the Earth with different frequency. Maybe they observe different uh, magnitude of the change. People are studying that. But I think uh, any strong conclusion at this point is uh, still not very controversial. It depending on that's right. Depending on whether you if you have a cold slab versus a normal mantle versus a plume, the temperature would also affect the transition kinetics. Yes. Yes. No, no. Definitely will extend over because of the presence of uh, minor elements such as iron and aluminum, other phases. So it's not a sharp boundary. Plus, you have multiple phases present, so they don't go through the transition at the same pressure and temperature. I think we're talking about the kilometers, definitely, not the meters. Meters, probably the seismic cannot even uh, resolve meters, right? At, at least from mineral physics point of view, is we're talking about the kilometers easily. Yes, Wang Ping. Mm. And also very important is really the uh, location issue. Typically, you know, my analogy is that the global Earth model is correct in the sense that it's a mathematical uh, entity. It's like this 2.1 trillion that we're supposed to have. That's right. <laughs> right, yeah. I think, you know, when we talk about these things, I'm really thinking about a 1D global model before getting into all these lateral heterogeneities, right? That's the next step you have to do. But that's really important for understanding dynamics because that's what uh, records the dynamic processes. Yes. Yes. That's right, because the, it's a simplified model. That's true, yeah. That we always have to keep in mind. And so now, we talk about the phase transition, but then phase transition does not happen at just one point. It, there is a phase boundary. So very fundamental, kind of from uh, chemistry and maybe college uh, study, you, you know this is the pressure temperature, there's a phase boundary, and you have phase A versus phase B, and here shows alpha and beta. When you change the uh, pressure a little bit, then the temperature will also shift a little bit. The boundary will be a curve. And at any point, if you take the tangent, that would be the slope. We call it Clapeyron slope. So the slope is usually when people talk about slope, we think about one slope. But the slope is actually a function of the pressure and temperature because it will uh, be the local tangent. And we would worry about the sign and the value of the slope because these values have uh, implications for the topography and dynamics of this boundary. You know, what, what kind of role the boundary will play? And if you go to the very basic thermodynamics, you have these uh, uh, state functions in thermodynamics, the Gibbs free energy. And if you change the Gibbs free energy by disturbing the pressure and temperature a little bit, this is the dt dp, you would change the free um, that gives free energy by this amount, this is the expression. Along the boundary, you always have these two uh, have the same uh, free energy. That's why they are coexisting in equilibrium. And the change in this 
free energy would also be the same. So if you change a little bit, then you have the same amount of change. If you do all these kind of uh, uh, calculations, substitute this into, you will get this relationship, delta V, which is the changing of volume between these two phases, delta S. That's the entropy difference between these two phases. If you rearrange it, you get the dP dt equals to Oh, sorry, this is a mistake. So delta S versus delta V. So this slope of the phase boundary depends on the volume difference and entropy difference between these coexisting phases. I want to go through this mainly because sometimes it's confusing for the new uh, people in the field. Like this D over here, this is a differential, like small infinitesimal change in pressure and temperature. And here, this is the difference between the two phases, the bulk difference between the two phases. So sorry for about this mistake. Uh, it should be removed over there. So when we look, about, look at the sign of a Clapeyron slope, we look at this equation again, dt, dp, delta v, delta s. So when you increase pressure, then the phase, you're going to favor a phase with smaller volume, a denser phase. When you increase temperature, you're going to favor a phase with higher entropy. So that's the direction of change. And that's the, how the system responds to the pressure and temperature change. When you increase pressure, the system trying to resist the, uh, the increase, they would shrink so that the pressure does not increase as much. Or when you increase temperature, the system will accommodate the temperature change by going to a higher entropy phase, which can take more entropy without increasing temperature. So this is the famous La Chatelier kind of principle. The system always resistant, resist the external change. So when you have these kind of uh, relation, for instance, if you look at the alpha to beta phase transition, this is the phase boundary over here. We can see that when you increase pressure, the temperature also goes up. So this is a positive Clapeyron slope, which is a common case. Most material behave that way. And the beta phase has a smaller molar volume. The beta phase is denser. And then it also has a, mo a smaller molar entropy. So it has uh, the, so when you have high pressure, it will favor the beta phase. And if you have a high temperature, it will favor the, uh, the alpha phase. So if you increase temperature, it goes to alpha phase. You increase pressure, it goes to beta phase. And this, in this case, you have so-called exothermic condition because the delta S over here would be a minus, a negative entropy change. That means you go to a lower entropy, you give out some heat when you go through the phase transition. Exo means heat come out. If you look at this other boundary, it's the opposite. And that one is very important, has, as has already been recognized in the geodynamic community. This one has a negative Clapeyron slope. This is an uncommon case. And this, in this case, these two phases together, they have a smaller molar volume. That's why when you increase pressure, you'll get to this breakdown. But then these two phases together, they have a larger molar entropy. So that this, as a result, you have a delta S, which is positive. Delta V is negative. So altogether, the slope is negative. It has a negative sign. And this one is endothermic. When you go through the phase transition, you will absorb heat. So these two are opposite. They have opposite thermal effect. So now, if you look at this, how would that play out in terms of a transition zone topography? We look at the bottom boundary, 660. You have the gamma phase or the spinel phase. There are different names, the ringwoodite. So it has a uh, different terminology, but we all refer to this cubic phase of Mg2SiO4, kind of a chemis chemical formula. And it breaks down to perovskite and ferropericlase. So when you have a slab or a cold material coming down, this slab, because it's colder, it's going to stay as a gamma phase for longer because the pressure, uh, dp, dt, so if you increase the pressure, the temperature, if you decrease the temperature because this is lower, the pressure is going to be lower. So it stays, the gamma phase will stay as gamma. The transition pressure is pushed up. The boundary of this 660 will be pushed down because it's colder. And the opposite, and if the plume comes up, then the boundary would be pushed upwards because this one is hotter, so that the dp is going to be lower, so that it would make the transition, uh, the breakdown at a lower pressure, higher temperature, lower pressure. And this lower temperature, uh, this one, the, this phase boundary is going to be at higher pressure. 
So you, have, you create this kind of a topography instead of a flat boundary. You have these valleys and, uh, and uh, um, peaks. And what the, is this going to do? Because the gamma phase, compared with the perovskite and ferropericlase, is a lighter phase. So it does not want to stay there. It has a lower density, so it has a tendency to kind of rise up. And this phase, because it's a denser phase, it has a tendency to go down. So it's resistance to plume rising, and this is resistance to slab sinking. So this boundary acts as a barrier to mantle convection because of the different clapeyron slopes. And if you look at the 410 boundary, the opposite would be true because 410 boundary has a positive, the phase boundary has a positive clapeyron slope. And you also want to look at the, the value of this transition because depending on how much this change is, you know, for a thousand degree temperature change, how many, what is the, uh, the amount of uh, change in the topography. So you can take this mineral physics measurement of this boundary, the Clapeyron slope, and then you can find if the slab has a temperature of minus 500 K, if slab is cooler than the surrounding mantle by 500 K, then the pressure would be 0.6 GPA. That means you'll push this down by about, maybe about 15 kilometers because of this uh, Clapeyron slope. And if the plume is a little bit warmer, like let's say 200 Kelvin warmer than the surrounding, then the pressure is going to be minus 0.3. So that means this transition is going to occur at slightly shallower depths by about 7.5 kilometers. So those kind of uh, slopes would play out in terms of mantle convection and the topography. And this might be able to, I think the seismic study will be able to detect the topography and we can correlate the two different uh, models to see if they are consistent. Yes? If you have, yes, you have a, a thermal, if you have slab and the plume going on at a certain uh, 660 boundary, then it's going to have a different uh, depth and a different width and a probably different magnitude because of the uh, both compositional and uh, the slab is going to have different composition from the surrounding mantle as well. So those thermal and the chemical effect is going to show up in the seismic measurements, the topography or, uh, yeah. Yes. Because I showed maps yesterday of yes. the topography of uh, both uh, 400 and 650. Yes. And there is a 650. Very Is that a new now? Wavelength in it. So uh, that's sort of additional argument. But these larger depressions are on the plus minus 20 uh, kilometer side. On the other hand, the uh, topography of 400 is, is not as strong. So the thickness of the uh, transition zone depends primarily on the uh, six. So yes, so that would be related to the, the value of the, the slope, you know, how large the change is. I don't know how much uh, heating or, you know, it, the slabs would experience as it goes through the transition zone. I guess in the places that I looked, uh, I didn't see much. Mm. You know. Yeah, that would be, that's surprising. Uh, uh, underneath. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but the important thing is people often think about these effects uh, within the slab, which is narrow. And the seismic observation uh. is the type of thing they do average it out. Yeah, even when it flattened out. That's right. That's a very good point because if you think about the value of the Clapeyron slope at 410, the slope is much steeper than at 660. So you would expect the opposite. So it must have something to do with the narrowness of the slab and how it flattens out, therefore shows up more prominently. Yes. That's right, yes. This is just one yeah, factor. That's right, it's not the only reason for the topography, yes. Uh, 
That's a very good question. For a while, it was all over the place. I will show that actually later on. We had a lot of uncertainty about how, you know, what's the slope, the value of the slope. And this one is the, from uh, Fayette L. Uh, this one, actually not everybody agrees with this value. This is relatively small. Uh, some people think its slope is, is, is deeper. But we had uh, even some people reporting positive slope. But that's uh, a result of um, uncertainty in mineral physics measurement. You mean the sign of the slope? Not the sign, oh, you mean the curvature? Uh, I think so far we're talking about a approximately linear uh, slope, because we don't really have a lot of measurements. Uh, once you get to the perovskite phase, your technique, you know, Dave Ruby showed multi anvil to diamond anvil cell. So mo this multi anvil can just barely reach the perovskite phase, and most of these studies are multi anvil studies where you have larger sample volume, your measurements are more uh, reliable. And if you want to study the curvature of the slope, then you need to convert it to, into diamond anvil cell. There are some measurements, but very controversial, very uncertain. Yeah. Yes? That's right. I mean, which one is more important? Than the other one? Which one is more important? Uh, it really depends on what you talk about. I think if I have to choose one, I would say composition. Because temperature, uh, when you talk about the transition on temperature, the variation is limited. So you're talking about basically the slope. You know, how much does the slope change when you change the, how, how much does the pressure change when you change the temperature? That's measured by the slope. But if you change the chemistry, then uh, you can easily, if you have aluminum-rich perovskite, the slope can shift by 2 GPA easily. And here we're talking about every 1,000 degree, you have about 1 GPA. So a, a simple-minded answer would be the chemistry plays a more important role. I mean, how much temperature do you need to cancel out the conversation? It does not always cancel out, depending on which way to go. It can enhance it, right? It can go in the same direction, depending. Because composition, you're talking about many variables. Could be iron, aluminum, and other things. It could be a different phase. You might be talking about anstatite phase instead of olivine phase, right? So I think the answer is not that simple. Yeah, OK. Yes, Steve. I don't know if this is the right time for me. Yeah. My understanding is a lot of these experiments are on pretty simple you know, MG, SI, iron, maybe calcium, aluminum. Yes. Um, but like, you know, titanium, chromium, yes. potassium. Mm. Uh, you know, is there a, a, a feeling that those aren't going to change this that much, or that people are well, doing that after we understand the simple system? I think it's both because the trace elements, we don't expect them to affect the phase boundaries significantly because the phase boundary, the phase is the structure really controlled by the major elements. And they're not quite trace, right? I mean, they're kind of minor. Minor. They do have big effects on they, you know, they have, phase, phase uh, relations in the upper mantle that we know a little bit. That's right. You could have an uh, uh, accessory kind of a component where you have a lot of chromium and so on, right? Yeah, I think. I think, the, of course, the first, uh, the main reason is because we, we haven't even figured out the simple systems yet, so we're not getting to the uh, next order questions. And at this point, uh, you know, maybe from seismic point of view, if you have a 1% or like a half percent of a chromi uh, uh, spinel or chromite, maybe the seismic s signal would also be buried. It's hard to detect. Eventually, you know, we want to really know the Earth's like oh, the mantle like we know the crust. At this point, not yet. Yes. That is something to be said about how the mantle, the lower mantle especially, becomes so simple mineralogically. You know, a lot of uh, composition, they would all go into just a limited number of structures. Unlike in the crust, you have so many major minerals. In the low mantle, you have basically have three main minerals. Maybe you have some uh, carbonates that people haven't, uh, or maybe carbides. But those are not considered a major phases. In the upper mantle, you have more major phases. So that's very neat, that the lower mantle become uh, simpler when you press, pressurize them. Oh, so 
So your point is that we actually, the mantle composition is simpler? Is that, did I get it right? Ah. Yeah. I think that that's probably because of lack of knowledge, not because of the nature being so uh, really. But in terms of mineralogy, that is the case, that you can squeeze a lot of things into a few. Like that's, that's another uh, Pauline's rule. That's the uh, principle of a parsimony, right? They, you know, the nature does not want to create a lot of blue, uh, blueprints. It has a few uh, mineral structure and stuff all kinds of things into it instead of starting with different structures all over. So we talk about the, the transition zone, but then more recently people have been looking at the D-double prime. Uh, that also has topography and structure because of this uh, perovskite and to post-perovskite phase transition. This was by many people uh, considered the most uh, significant discovery of the last decade now, because of 2004, we're already 2012. So this discovery, it was speculated there might be some transition going on, otherwise the lower mantle is so boring, it's perovskite throughout. But then right before it reached the core boundary, it's possible, it's likely at this point that it goes through another phase transition into this post-perovskite phase. And this post-perovskite phase has a positive Claparon slope. And if along the same line, it will create topography. In a colder region, you have this kind of uh, upwards convex uh, shape. And then if you have a warmer region, you have this concave topography at the lower mantle. And depending on the composition also, if you add iron into it, then the depths where this transition happens. So I want to explain a little bit because not everybody is familiar. These are different geotherms at this region, lowermost mantle, warm, intermediate, and a cold region. And then depending on the temperature, you are crossing the phase boundary at a different depth, right? And then uh, if you have iron, then this boundary itself, the blue line is pushed in a direction. I say in a direction because we actually don't know. This is just uh, from Shim's paper. He chose that it's pushed up to a lower pressure. But there are de there's still debate about which way does iron change the phase boundary. But as a result, you'll change the topography. And there's also this interesting uh, phenomenon that maybe you have so-called double crossing, which creates a post perovskite lens. This happens because uh, this phase boundary with this kind of Claparon slope compared with the uh, geotherm in this region, if you have this warm case, maybe you have no crossing at all. And if you have this curvature of the geotherm, because this is a, a close to uh, this is a thermal boundary layer, it has this special shape, it's not an adiabat. So you might cross the boundary twice, and you create so-called post perovskite lens. This lens is over here. In this region, you have post perovskite, and above and below, you have a perovskite. So it could be no, nothing, no post perovskite in the mantle if it's hot, and then you create a lens if it's colder. So if you are evolving through time with temperature changing, you might have a different structure in the D double prime. And that's related to the phase transition and how the Claparon slope changes um, as a function of temperature and what the Claparon slope sign and the value is by itself. This is another representation by uh, some of the main players in the beginning, Ale and uh, uh, Hirose and and the uh, Herland, they propose this kind of uh, structure. So again, you see the hot, uh, warm, and cold geotherm in this lowermost mantle. And you see that in some region, you have uh, no post perovskite and the other region you have these kind of post perovskite lenses and how that's going to interact with the subducted slab and then plume and so on. So it can introduce quite interesting phenomena. And for mineral physicists, our goal is to determine this uh, slope and how to see what, how does composition change it and what's the curvature as a function of pressure in a very luxurious kind of way because right now we're just treating it as a linear slope. We don't get much better than that when we have to do experiments under the D double prime kind of pressure temperature conditions. The uncertainties are very large. So this is just a, a summary of uh, these you know, topography structure and how this double crossing could happen. No question. So, so we talked about this before, how iron would lower and broaden phase boundary in the known phase diagram 
For post-perovskite, we don't know whether it lowers or it uh, raises phase boundary. But within the transition zone upper mantle regime, we know this is the case. So here is the phase diagram for pure iron uh, end member. This is the forced right case. And then in this case, we have a certain amount of uh, iron bridge component. And we often call these magnesium woodstite, or, but it's also known as ferropericlase. That's just a terminology, because uh, FEO is woodstite. If you have magnesium added to F, uh, FEO, you call it magnesium woodstite. But uh, MGO is a periclase. If you add iron to periclase, it's called a ferropericlase. So depending on the ratio of iron versus magnesium, it's magnesium rich, you can call it ferropericlase. It's iron rich, magnesium woodstite. So that's totally terminology, but I think for people from uh, outside the field, sometimes it's confusing. You know, what are you talking about? So you, you see this uh, alpha phase over here. This boundary, you, know, you have just a boundary at a given temperature. But here, if you have iron in the system, if you follow the phase rule, there is one more degree of freedom here because you introduce one more component. And then as a result, at a given condition, for instance, over here in this region, uh, this, um, maybe this phase boundary, you see that you have a phase loop over here. If you are at this pressure, and uh, with certain amount of iron, you could have two phases coexisting. And that coexisting phase and the partitioning of the iron between the two phases, let's say we look at this transition over here from alpha to beta, uh, if you add 14 GPA, you have a transition here, then you would have a phase, alpha phase, that is relatively poor in iron, and you have a beta phase that's relatively rich in iron. Because of partitioning of iron between these two phases, it's going to change the magnitude of uh, delta rho and delta Vs and Vp, because iron has strong effect on density and velocities. So this presence of iron not only going to change the location of the boundary, and the width of the boundary is also going to affect the magnitude of seismic, like of density and velocity jumps. So that is a very important factor when you try to match the seismic profile with geochemical models. And for post-perovskite, perovskite to post-perovskite transition, we say iron shifts and broadens the transition. Broadens, we know for sure, because of the phase rule. Because you have one more degree of freedom, so you would have a phase loop like this. But whether this is going to uh, make the phase transition happening at a higher pressure or lower pressure is controversial. This uh, set of data by Wendy Mao et al., they show that when you add iron, this transition is going to occur at a lower pressure. It starts at a lower pressure and it goes through a range of pressure. So for pure end member, it starts at nearly 120 GPA. The core mantle boundary is 136, so that's pretty close. But if you add iron, the transition will, uh, will start to happen near like 100 GPA, but then it goes through this uh, almost uh, you know, more than 10 GPA pressure range. And then you have partitioning between the, these two phases as well. The perovskite phase will take uh, less iron, and post-perovskite phase will take more iron. So this is uh, the image kind of proposed by uh, Mao et al. They think there's iron-rich post-perovskite there. Because of the iron enrichment, the shear velocity gets affected significantly because iron really plays a role, a significant role in changing the shear property. You know, once iron go into the structure, this, uh, it increases um, maybe vacancy and uh, uh, then lower the, the shear strength of the material. So here we have iron pool, post-perovskite, uh, depending on uh, the pressure, uh, the, the, this one actually also involves the core because you are interacting with the outer core. So the partitioning between perovskite and post-perovskite in the mantle region, and there is interaction between, between the core. The core would supply iron. So you would create post-perovskite with different iron content, and then uh, it also partition with perovskite. And that generates all kinds of dynamics in the DW prime zone. So that's the, the transition uh, at the higher pressure. You mean this one? Green. These these lines? <laughs> Turbulence? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a cartoon. <laughs> it makes it look pretty, but I think it doesn't probably have a, quite a lot of physical basis. 
So just to let, look at this effect of iron again as a whole, so this is a table from uh, Stickshoe's review article in Treaty on Geophysics. And we have the whole bunch of different minerals, plagioclase, vanilla, olivine, wasleyite, ringwoodite, and then you know, uh, this is uh, HCPCX, this calcium perovskite, uh, Akimoto wide, this is a different uh, composition when you have antitide composition, garnet, stichovite, perovskite, ferropericlis. So you see all these things. This is the bulk modulus. And this is how the bulk modulus gets affected by iron. If you change from pure magnesium end member to pure iron end member, how much the bulk modulus is going to change? And what you see in general is it doesn't change very much. You see many zeros and occasionally a like, small number. If you compare with shear, you will see that the effect on shear is much more significant because these numbers are much larger. You don't see any zero here. And then you also, these are more like uh, less significant because of these are the uh, derivative of K0, so second order kind of issue uh, properties. So when you look at these basic relationship, you see density is uh, mass divided by V. When you introduce iron, iron is, uh, has such a much higher atomic mass. So when you replace magnesium by 10% iron, you increase the mass by about 4%. Yes? So Yes. Uh, you're creating especially high pressure. Yes. Kind of yes. How can you be sure that your final product has however much iron you expect it to be? Yes. You don't really, uh, really know. This uh, is a, a compilation of uh, data plus uh, calculation. So this is ideal case. You know, actually, for perovskite, the pure N iron end member does not even exist. It's not stable, right? So you basically add maybe 10% iron, and you see how much, how much it changes, and you scale it up. So this value is not totally, uh, you shouldn't bet on these values. But they serve as indication how much iron, uh, addition of iron is going to change the elasticity. So for density, the volume doesn't change very much because although iron is a heavier, more atomic mass, the ionic radius of iron and the magnesium, they're quite comparable, 0.72 versus 0.78. And it also depends on the valence state and spin state. They might be almost the same if you are in the low spin iron. So volume doesn't change very much. The mass changes by about 4% for 10% of uh, replacement of iron. If you have a magnesium number of 90, like 490, then you would have 4% denser material. And then if you look at the velocities, in this case, the bulk modulus, as you see, does not change very much if you add a little bit of iron. But density changes. So when density goes down, the velocity of density goes up, the velocity is going to go, go down. So adding iron is going to lower the uh, bulk the, the sound velocities in general. That's not absolutely true, but uh, as a rule of thumb, that's the case. When you add iron, uh, velocity drops. Then the shear velocity is uh, similar. Then if you here, you, you actually lower the shear modulus when you add iron, and you, you increase density. So you have a double action by you know, increasing this number, decreasing that number, so the shear velocity is going to drop. Adding iron is going to significantly drop, reduce the shear velocity. So that's the effect of iron. So now we talk about iron, and there are some interesting things about iron as a transition metal with variable valence st uh, valency state, sometimes it's called oxidation state. So this is a uh, electronic shell structure of iron, and then in the 3D orbital, it's not fully uh, occupied, so for the metallic iron, you have only six electrons in D, where it can take 10. And then if you lose the two uh, S, four S electrons, you become ferrous iron, Fe2+, plus. you get 3D6 without the fourth uh, S shell. And if you lose one more electron, then you get 3D5. And that's the electronic configuration. And this one is called a ferric iron. And these different iron, valence state, there is a interesting kind of a discovery back in, uh, now is uh, more than it's 15 years ago. So this is uh, known as the self-redox uh, reaction. What happens is you start with Fe2 plus in a OPX that has the Mg, Fe, 
uh, SiO3, same composition as perovskite, and it starts all as Fe2+, and when you convert into perovskite, it breaks down, uh, actually not, in this case it's not breakdown, when you convert it into perovskite, it produces Fe3+, and the metallic iron. And this is especially uh, significant if you have aluminum in the system. So if you have aluminum bearing OPX uh, sample, you pressurize it to produce perovskite, you generate ferric iron out of ferrous iron, and you produce metallic iron. This is self-redox, so there's no oxygen uh, to as, act as a oxidation agent. And then this happens, especially for aluminum, because of the crystal chemistry. The Fe3 plus and aluminum, they can couple together to replace F Mg2 plus and Si4 plus. So this again goes back to Pauline's rules about the, how uh, different ions can substitute each other. You have to satisfy two conditions. One is the size has to be comparable. The other one is the charge has to be balanced. So you have charge balance over here and then the sizes, uh, the Fe will probably go into the M Mg side because they have a comparable uh, radius radii and the aluminum and the silicon will substitute each other. Sometimes even in the absence of aluminum, the iron three plus can do the self kind of a coupled substitution. So two of them, they will each enter different size and get this kind of a, uh, reaction. So this, this kind of a substitution stabilizes Fe three plus in alumina, uh, in perovskite and that leads to these kind of uh, self-redox reaction. That kind of reaction is quite significant uh, there was this image, I think uh, yesterday Dave Ruby already said um, this might be a uh, change now. But it was proposed that you can have a oxygen pump happening in the What happens is you start with Fe2 plus in the upper mantle when they go through the transition zone, becoming perovskite, convert into perovskite, it will produce Fe3 plus, and then shed iron, metallic iron. The metallic iron will join the core, and then you end up with more Fe3 plus, a smaller ratio of uh, iron to oxygen. And then through mantle convection, maybe this Fe3 plus will come to the shallow mantle again and oxidizes the shallow mantle. So this would have consequences in, in terms of uh, element how the chemistry of the mantle play out. So if you look at these things, this, these are different iron uh, oxidation state and then with this very peculiar kind of reaction which can be understood from crystal chemistry point of view, then you might generate different oxidation kind of uh, uh, processes in the, in the earth mantle. But then that is, has been known for a while. More recently, People look at the spin state of iron, and that again has to do with iron being a transition element. So in the 3D shell, we have five different orbitals. In the saturated case, you would have two electrons occupying every orbital. You would have 10 electrons. But iron does not have 10, as we said. It only has six or five, depending on what kind of valence state it has. And if you have a spherical, environment, that means you have free iron standing in a totally homogeneous isotropic environment, you would have all the five orbitals at the same energy level. We call that the degeneracy. So they don't really distinguish from each other. They are the same energy. So you can occupy them freely. It doesn't make any difference. But once you put iron into a crystal, the iron is going to be surrounded by oxygen around it. So you, have, you create a crystal field. So the environment is no longer isotropic. You would create a certain anisotropy. And the energy would split. If you have a cubic struct, uh, which is relatively symmetric, a cubic crystal system, and if you occupy an octahedral side, that means every ion has six oxygen surrounding it. In this more symmetric case, the 3D orbital, the five orbitals, was split into two sets. They have a lower energy, the T2G levels, and then the higher energy, EG levels. So these T2G levels would be the orbits that occupies the orbits that cross uh, axis. If you think about the Cartesian uh, coordinates, you have X, Y, Z. These will c occupy you know, 45 degrees cutting through the uh, quadrants. And these would be along axis. So this will be along X and Y, and this will be along Z. So these are two s different sets of orbitals. And let's go back to uh, chemistry. 
And then in the props guide, we actually have orthorhombic structure, lower symmetry. Yes, Patrick? How does the energy of the, how much of that energy gap compared to the thermal energy? That, oh, that's a very, very good question. That energy usually uh, is on the, on the order of uh, uh, one or two EV. So it is, uh, compared with thermal energy, it's significant. But there is a countering uh, energy, like fighting with this kind of crystal field splitting, I will show in a minute. So we have the props guide, which has orthorhombic structure, it's lower symmetry, it's not cubic. It occupies a side that's eight to 12 coordination. So this side is distorted, it's hard to tell because not every oxygen has the same distance to iron. So we can count uh, depending on how you look at it. In this case, then this energy will further split because of this asymmetry and isotropy. You would split into five different levels. So these are the crystal field splitting in iron when, you, when they are in a crystal and occupying different site. And if you look at them together, you have spherical case, five orbitals degenerate. And if you have a cubic uh, case, you have these two level of energy. And you have a, a less symmetric case, it can split into five different orbitals. And the consequences of this splitting, you can see that with, because of crystal field uh, splitting, you, you can create something called crystal field stabilization energy because now you have two sets of orbitals. This is called so-called a pairing energy. That pairing energy is if you want to put electrons, two electrons in the same orbital, you have to pay this kind of energy because they don't really want to be together. When you have these kind of uh, crystal field splitting, you occupy the low energy first and only one of the electron is forced to pair. This is the case for Fe2+, plus, when you have six electrons in the 3D orbital. So this, in this case, we call it high spin because only one is paired or the other four, they are single, they, are, they have parallel spins. They would together have a local magnetic moment that the spins will add up together. When you increase pressure, what happens is this crystal field splitting energy is going to go up because the, the, um, the electrons, they, the orbits, they get kind of a closer together, the electron gets uh, denser, but the, the energy will uh, be f f uh, further apart. But the pairing energy does not really change. This is a, you know, separate. It doesn't get affected by the, the volume change or by the compression very much. So as a result, if you want to go to the occupying lower energy, you start with this uh, uh, T2G orbitals. And the next thing you do is actually you pair, because it's uh, more energy, uh, it's lower energy for you to pair than to go to the other orbital, T2G. So you end up with three pairs of electrons. They're all paired. Pairing uh, saves energy relative to going to the next set of uh, uh, orbits. So this one is called high spin. But this one, because they're all paired, there's no single spin left. So this one has a moment, spin moment of zero. You end up with the low spin configuration you lose the magnetic moment because they're all paired together, although they are kind of plotted as separate thing, but this is the same orbital. It's just for illustration, they are kind of put aside. They, dif they do have different energy. They have two electrons in the same orbital, they have different energy level. So the pressure will in in induce that kind of spin transition. But then when you have the less symmetrical case, we have five different energy levels, then you have, can have additional phenomenon called intermediate spin state. So this is the case, you have high spin, so you kind of flip one down, this is the starting point, you have to pair one. But then when you increase pressure, another will come down because of the, the, uh, the uh, difference between the pairing energy and the, the crystal field uh, splitting energy. So it's more advantageous for it to pair only one. But then you increase pressure further, then the other one also comes down. They get all paired. So you have high spin, intermediate spin, and low spin if you have the case of less symmetry. <coughs> yes, Peter? Lower symmetry here with, uh, less That's right. Okay. Yes. This is the case in, for Prov's guide. When you have orthorhombic structure and a distorted side, you would have. This is a very simple minded structure. I have to say, for instance, people like Rasma in the audience probably think this is too, you, you have to think about the band theory. But for us, you know, just to get an idea of what's going on, this is very helpful. It's uh, not the, exactly the right uh, picture. So you have these different cases uh, with uh, 
more symmetric cubic structure, you have high spin to low spin transition in Fe2+. Plus. And then for uh, orthorhombic structure, you might have diff three different spin states. So that's what we're thinking about. And then you can use different methods to probe the spin state. But I think I'm going to skip those technical part because I, I don't think I have a, do I have a, how much time do I have? Okay, then I'm going to skip the technical part. So just to say you can use MOS power spectroscopy to uh, probe the spin state and measure the valence state. And then you can also use X-ray emission spectroscopy, which probes the local moment of iron. And you can look at those satellite peaks and so on. So these are the techniques we use to find out what kind of spin state, valence state we have in iron. And now I'm going to jump to the results, the people, the dis discoveries. So for ferropericlase, which is a cubic structure, it's relatively simple. It's actually a lot simpler than Prof's guide. Uh, there was this discovery of high spin with a, a prominent satellite peak to low spin. The satellite peak goes away. You have a spin transition. Later on, it was uh, um, recognized that when you, this is at 300K measurements. So at ambient condition, you have these kind of relatively sharp. It's actually not that sharp if you look at the data. But if you increase temperature, then this uh, there's spin transition is going to smear out. So as a result, you have this high spin, low spin, and you have a spin transition zone. So you would have a gradual broadening kind of a, a spin, mixed spin state. And finally, it goes from one to another. This is for ferropericlase. And for Prof's guide, the situation is a lot more complicated and more controversial. So this is a study showing initially you have high spin. At 100 GPA for different alumina bearing, different alumina free, you have a kind of either intermediate or mixed spin state because the satellite peak is a lot more subdued. It's much smaller, but it's still there. It's probably half of the. Um, the, the height. And then there are other studies saying, oh, actually it goes away by 145 GPA. But this study hasn't been confirmed. Actually, more recent study shows even by uh, 100, I think this is also 140 some degree, you still have a, a half of the intensity there. And then they are saying maybe the analysis, you know, the, 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 and the, how the data was reduced was not entirely uh, correct. And you have another study showing that this is low spin, this is high spin, and this is intermediate spin. So there are propo pro proposal that you actually end up with intermediate spin. So here we have intermediate sp uh, spin or mixed spin because you have iron two plus, iron three plus. It's kind of a it's a mess for proskite. Proskite is really uh, very complicated. So we don't really have a firm conclusion what kind of spin state we have. And when we think about temperature, it becomes more. Um, difficult to untangle all these things. But the bottom line is we do see spin transition. How it happens, or the details, we're not sure. So these are comparisons between ferropericlase and the Prof's guide. A lot more clear picture for ferropericlase and a lot more complicated, very complicated for Prof's guide. And why do we care about the spin crossover? Because it will affect the physical properties. You have this volume versus pressure kind of relation. You can see that the spin transition will cause a change in the compression curve, that there are different compressibilities. The spin transition will harden the material. And more recently, this study shows ferropericlase. So the quality is not very good. But you can see this is magnesium member without iron, no change, a smooth uh, Vs versus pressure. But when you look at the iron bearing sample, these uh, uh, solid circles, you can see that they fall in onto two different curves. So low spin, high spin has this kind of trajectory or pressure dependence. And low spin, you would have a, a more or less a jump in the shear velocity. So the spin state really will, will affect the uh, elastic properties. And there are also studies showing the change in um, thermal conductivity. So you can see that high spin starts as a kind of a purple pink color. Once you put it under pressure, it goes to low spin, it becomes dark, it becomes opaque. So there is a apparent change in optical property, which will have implications for radiative conductivity, which according to Dave Stevenson is not important, but that's what happens to the material. So we don't know, right? And then there are also chemical behavior. When you have spin transition, there was a study uh, in nature showing when you put a pyrolyte under pressure, there is a 
peak in this KD, which measures the iron partitioning between perovskite and, and the ferropericlase. And because of the spin transition, you actually have a kind of abnormal behavior of partition. Iron partitioning will be affected. Although my personal opinion, and it's also supported by more recent study, is because spin crossover in general in the mantle is quite gradual and broad. So, and also FP3 plus would have a very strong preference. It almost does not go to ferropericlase. So I don't think this effect would be really dramatic. It probably has an effect, but I don't know how much it is going to show up. A few words about equation of state, which we're going to do tutorial in the afternoon. This is full of equations, right? It's called equation of state. One is based on finite strain theory using Eulerian strain as listed here, which measures the volume change uh, when you compress the sample. And this is based on finite strain theory and applied thermodynamics definition of pressure. It's a macroscopic point of view. You look at a macroscopic property like volume, uh, pressure, and then modulus, they're derivative. And that's the birch manahan uh, third order equation of state expression over here that we're going to plug in the, I'm not going to go through the details because in my opinion, equation of states are really important but they're so boring. They're really boring and drilling. <laughs> Very, uh, just like, okay, it's going to change like this and that. And then, of course, in the mantle, we cannot do 300K equation of state. We have to do hot birch manahan equation of state. What you do is you increase temperature first. So you try to measure the volume at a high temperature. You do an isobaric heating. Then you do isothermal compression. Then you can apply this birch manahan uh, equation of state again, except for you have to use the volume at a high temperature. You have to use the bulk modulus and their derivative at a high temperature. And here is how you kind of calculate the high temperature moduli. So you can do these two steps to get the hot birch manahan equation of state. That's the macroscopic kind of a treatment. You can also have the microscopic kind of point of view, looking at atomic potential and the lattice dynamics. And we're going to talk about the lattice dynamics a little bit more when we talk about the core material, because there we also worry about density. Uh, velocities and so on. So atomic potential point of view, you have these kind of uh, energy as a function of uh, distance. And then we have, in the ideal case, you have harmonic kind of crystal. That shape of this uh, curve will determine the, the bulk modulus. If the shape is very steep, then you have a higher modulus. If it's more kind of open, you have a lower modulus. And then this one is, uh, the, the actual crystal is not totally harmonic. It has an harmonicity. So that curve actually have this asymmetric shape so that the atoms, uh, electrons over here, uh, atoms over here actually, they would come out instead of uh, being confined in here, they might uh, go off here so that the, the average position actually will change. This leads to thermal expansion. And then this thermal expansion will have some effect on density and other properties. And if you go through those things, you can come up with a thermal pressure term. So you have a a fixed volume, at zero temperature, it has certain pressure. But if you increase temperature, it's going to generate a thermal pressure. And this thermal pressure can be calculated following this uh, Debye model. This is a Debye uh, integral, third order integral. You can go through like lattice vibration, different vibration modes, how that contributes to the thermal energy and finally thermal pressure. And here, the Grunison parameter is important. That measures how Debye temperature changes function of volume. And usually, we try to end up just with the Grunison parameter describing this whole uh, equation of state. But in reality, uh, it's more complicated. You sometimes have to introduce a Q, which means Grunison parameter is no longer constant. It actually also depends on volume. So you describe that kind of uh, dependency using Q. And then sometimes even the Q is not enough. You have to introduce the Q0, Q1. Then, the, because Q, again, is still not a constant with volume. So it gets complicated. And you see, you get the point. Uh, equation state is very boring. <laughs> but it's really important, because we already talked about the 660 transition, for instance. We have this kind of a big uh, controversy, a story about how the 660 does not match the, po the post spinel transition. So here is a quench study from 89. It shows there's a good match. The boundary and the 660, the pressure is about the same. But then in 1998 and 2003, they measured the boundary again. This is the boundary 98. This is the boundary 2003. They did in situ measurements. They were able to measure the pressure using X-ray diffraction. They're saying the transition pressure is a lot lower. It's below 660. 
so and then people start to question whether six sixty is really due to this transition turns out yes oh i'm almost done yeah so there is a different uh, pressure scale, gold scale, MGO scale. You can see the discrepancy among the scales are like a 2 GPA. So if you look at the, later on this study, this curve over here is using the MGO scale that is kind of internally consistent with large set of data and also with uh, DFT calculations. You get this boundary, and this boundary again is consistent. So this this is, shows how equation of state, which is used to calibrate the pressure, how important that is, because that really affects your overall conclusion. And I think this one will be my last slide, although I have one more that I'm not going to show. This is the, the, the discussion we had earlier about the recent study by Murakami et al. They proposed that if you have, uh, they measured, what they did is they measured the shear velocity of, the, of uh, Prof's guide. And I think they also have ferropericlase. They have different measurements, sound velocity measurements using Brion uh, spectroscopy. They measured those, this uh, data, and then these, these are the prem value. What you can see is this is a pyrolyte. It plots way below if they use their data. This is a perovskite uh, velocity as a function of pressure. This is ferropericlase velocity as a function of pressure. What you want to do is to combine these two in different proportions to generate prem. And you can see perovskite plot right on prem. That means you cannot tolerate much ferropericlase at all. And if you have a pyrolyte model, it ends up much lower than prem. And these measurements will indicate they kind of consider different uh, mental convection model. And these measurements will, will have the implication, very strong implication, the lower mantle is more or less made of perovskite, 93%, with very little ferropericlase. That means the MGSI ratio of the lower mantle is going to be much lower than the upper mantle, which is more closer to olivine. And that has a whole bunch of other implications. But we have to, of course, be cautious about these measurements, how reliable they are, whether they are consistent with other type of measurements, whether they have some kind of experimental artifacts not accounted for. So that's the debate that we had uh, in the beginning. And that, again, shows how important the elasticity and the density of state would, are important, because these kind of gradient and where the lines are heavily depends on the iron content and then the uh, equation, the elasticity of these things. And yeah. Temperature. temperature matters, and that's the strength of the measurements because they were first to do simultaneous pressure and temperature measurement, right? But their temperature is not quite uh, the the actual temperature, and you have to consider how much the temperature has a very strong effect, and that's the main contribution of this experimental study. Yeah, they put it about 2,200, and that's why it's. That's probably too low, right? They do have references, right? But well, they have references here. Right? So maybe they chose the wrong friends. And they're not doing the right. <laughs> yes. That's right. I lied. That's my last slide. But uh, feel free to go to coffee. 
I just want to be optimistic that we are now state of the art. We are able to reach these kind of condition. And uh, you know, I also want to say there's a planetary comparison, a different parameter space that material scientists really want to do. That then you can check your model. And CIDR, I think, is really critical to combine different disciplines. And mineral physics, without seismology and the geochemistry, we won't be. You know, we are useless. Yeah. Yes. Ah. That's right. Yes. So, well, if you are separating the iron, then you're going to also separate all the other sitter phylums that are going to dissolve the iron. So that's not a process that you can tolerate based on sitter phylum and phylum. I don't, I don't like that process, but it's very popular in the community. Yeah, Actually, my experiments does not support that. But I haven't. About the, the produ production of uh, metallic iron, in my experiment, I don't observe it. But I, don't, I, don't, I cannot say this is not correct. Maybe something else was going on. It doesn't actually work uh, during cold formation, but it works after, after. cold formation to raise yeah. the oxidation state. Right. But I think Rick is saying you also have other consequences when you, so you know. Work in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately. Well, immediately, right. Once. Because even as you say, you have to remove the iron. So the idea yeah. is that immediately afterwards, when you still have some contact between the mantle and the core, you lose a little bit of metal. But that reaction should be occurring today. Right. And my point being is that it can occur all at once. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah.